The current presentation is a uh, uh, nanosat saturation for water monitoring system <coughs> by the Sean Turtle from the uh, University of New Canberra, Australia. Today, uh, mission proposal cannot come here. So here, let me explain. Good morning, hi, thank you very much everybody. Um, as you probably guessed, I'm not from Ghana, but I'm presenting on behalf of um, the mission developers, Isaac Yaboa and Mohamed Bana from the State Science Fiction Research Institute in Ghana, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. So if you'll bear with me, I'm actually also, I'm presenting a combined presentation as a resource provider which will be the last part of this presentation. So um, I'll make the excuse now that I'm not very familiar with what's behind the system development at the moment, but I will do my best to present it to you. Um, so yes, we will just go across, cover the, the background and the operational concept, um, having a look at some of the likely risks and outcomes, how it might be implemented, and then I'll move on to the resource provider's presentation and explain why um, I've proposed that we act as a resource provider. So, like quite a few countries, Ghana and its neighbors, Burkina Faso, and some of the countries around about are subject to flooding and, and typically the flooding drought cycles that we see in some places too. So. If you look at this chart up here, both Ghana and Burkina Faso are really dominated by the River Volta and its flooding, and the majority of the land area is affected by this river. And there are a number of lakes, well, two in particular that were mentioned, Lake Volta, which is the big blue blotch that you can see there, and with the view from space to the right. And then down near the capital, Accra, there's also Lake Waija. And this is important for the water supply in Ghana, and it's also subject to the flooding of the River Volta. Now, as in particular in this community, you would know that the idea of a, a flood monitoring nanosatellite constellation is not new or novel, <coughs> but what is unique about it is that it's a Ghanaian proposal to deal with one of their own problems, and it's also a vehicle for their development locally, so education and trying to um, bring space activity to Ghana, so it should be applauded for that reason. Here you can see, of course, the effect of flooding. Um, you can see some of the, the figures here that um, there's been significant flooding for quite a while. And as you'll see on the next slide, in fact, just last month, there was particularly bad flooding which led to explosions in petrol stations and so on. And so this largely comes down to how you deal with the flooding. The space system obviously can't stop the flooding, but it can help you manage the problem and be prepared for it better. Now you might ask yourselves, right, why do we need a, a space system for all this? We could just go use the mobile phone network and monitor a whole lot of flood monitoring sensors distributed around the country. Well, this is correct, but if you look at the map here, which shows you, say, the, the GSM mobile coverage in the region, um, the red arrows are pointing to the critical regions of for the flooding, so Lake Volta there above and Lake Waija outside Accra. The red blotches, if you can see them, are where there's good mobile coverage. So basically nowhere near where the source of the flooding is. So you can't rely on a terrestrial network um, for 
the kind of flood monitoring system that the Ghanaian team has in mind. So the mission objectives are really to implement a ground-based flood monitoring system with a space segment which will capture the data and feed it into um, the necessary people to manage flood flooding in the region. And they were looking at doing this beyond just Ghana, but involving their neighbors. One of the things they are doing is actually developing the water monitoring or the flood monitoring devices themselves. These will be solar power based, most likely. Um, so one objective was to develop a ground station, and I believe this is up and running, or at least to the extent that they can receive signals from the ISS and start calibrating it. Um, their objectives, and this I, I can't explain the reasoning behind this yet, but seems to be focused on having three CubeSats in the orbit, so a small constellation. Um, probably there needs to be more analysis of the, the constellation design, so the, the spacing or the phasing of the satellites and so on. But this is a, a good starting point and it, it will evolve from there, I'm sure. And then obviously the final objective is to take the data and give it to someone who can actually make good use of it, so the local authorities and the people responsible for managing nat natural disasters. So here you can see graphically the, the operational concept. Basically the CubeSat will be taking in a whole lot of sensor data from the region of the flood prone areas. And as you can see, for a relatively small country, um, the, the kind of system that we'll, we'll be they're talking about in a moment, the satellites will probably be seeing both the ground station and the majority of these sensors at the same time. So one of the key things that will be need to be developed is the data management on board, how they take the multi-sensor input, um, differentiate between them and pass the information on usefully. As I said, the baseline is looking like a low number of 3U cube size sat three U size cube satellites, and there will be a, a single central ground station in the capital, Accra. And from the figure on the right, you can see um, the sort of coverage that, or the, the view from the satellite. So as I say, you will see sensors and ground station most likely all the time at the same time. They have a an interesting flood monitoring sensor which is using ultrasound and it's quite high frequency so that it makes it, it so that it's quite robust against minor things like ripples and waves and that it's not confused by small changes. They take a high frequency of sampling and average it over time. And um, that's one of the, the first things they need to develop. I believe they are already planning tests with a water tank in the near future. And again, you can see most likely 3U CubeSat. For the, the kinds of communication systems that seem to be planned, EHF, and, and the, the, ra the viewing range, I suspect they don't need a high degree of pointing accuracy. So for the attitude control system, may be sufficient with magnetometers or maybe viewers that, that yet to be defined. Um, they are planning on using GPS for um, a receiver to help determine the position of the satellites in the, in the orbit and then accelerometers for the, the input to the attitude control. And they've done some initial sizing uh, calculations for a link budget and the numbers that you can see there are not not alarming for this size system, so they seem to be in the order of magnitude you would expect. Now, here you can see some preliminary orbital analysis, and one of the things you'll notice is there's also some 
activity taking place to the right in Australia and I'll come to this in a moment. But basically we're looking at some sort of not very high inclination orbit for the equatorial location. As I've identified the, the sorts of risks you would expect, um, these need to be monitored through the, the development of the program, but uh, number five is the typical run with small projects like these. People come and go. So at the moment, the team size is six. The uniqueness, as I said before, is this is the Van Ames doing something for themselves, both trying to deal with a, a local problem and also to grow space engineering knowledge and education within their country. And their, their sensor is unique in, in that um, I think one of the people did a master's project on it in, in Germany before he returned to China. Um, the development schedule at the moment looks like this. They want to have a final design by the end of 2017, which is a, a reasonable target, I think. Um, a flight model to follow sometime after that. The ground station's con already constructed, as I said. And the launching, I don't know what the plan is, so I can't comment. Um, so collaborating with us as a resource provider and people in Japan and their neighbors. So if I just jump for the last few minutes to the resource provider presentation. Hi, I'm Sean Tuttle from University of Canberra. University of New South Wales in Canada. Um, I'll give a quick overview of what we have and what we are building up there and why we would like to be a resource provider. This doesn't seem to be an extremely legible slide, but basically the university is investing quite a lot of money at the moment to build up our space capabilities. Um, that started with me two years ago joining them and we're hiring a steadily a, a team of engineers to support its CubeSat programs for various activities, largely um, improving knowledge of the upper atmosphere. But also we're looking very importantly at developing technologies for all kinds of spacecraft and with a particular focus on uh, improving quality of life on Earth through space applications. Um, as you can see here, we have a thermal vacuum chamber. It's two in fact. They're in various stages of development, um, partially ready for use. We have a, a large laboratory which we're building up and turning into a clean environment. And our ground station is taking place on the roof there with a, a small S-band antenna and a quite a large radio antenna. So we offer master's programs online and um, research degrees, so PhD, and the university has a newly stated aim to become an active and responsible global player. So um, by getting involved with the Ghana team, this would be a, a, a good and sensible step for us because in parallel we're growing these capabilities and we would like to do something more than just produce academic papers but something worthwhile for the planet. Now, again, if you can read the text there, I will buy you a beer later. But um, the reason why we adopted as a starting point the Grand Am team to focus on as a resource provider, and I should add that we, we, we're interested in all kinds of collaboration, but the mentoring resource provider, the Grand Am idea is a good one because believe it or not in the state of Queensland in Australia we're subject to the same sort of flooding and drought cycles and surprisingly they are very poorly managed and there's a lot of criticism as state government and so on about how it's managed. A lot of it comes down to the very flat nature of the country but only a small change in water level can lead to quite um, drastic and sudden flooding and it's not, uh, there's not a, a, lo a long time in advance in which these things are, are, are well predicted. So a system that gives a lot more and more real-time data could actually improve, improve this local situation quite well. 
Now, if you look at the map, the latitude is similar enough that you know you could combine the system for both countries, and they're very conveniently spaced in longitude, so that you've got some time on orbit to do things other than read sensor data. So there's actually some quite good points about combining this activity for both countries. Um, if you look at the graph on the left with the ground stations, the two left-hand red circles on the bottom axis would be Ghana and then Brisbane in Queensland, and then the third one is Canberra, where we are. So equatorial orbits, you can see the or, or, all orbits will have good visibility. And even in Queensland, the GSM network is not great in the areas where you really need it. Thank you. I think the water of the flood will will be brought by the land to the end. So uh, you you said you 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 will use a, a solar power system for uh, uh, water monitoring. Uh, how many days uh, will be survive in such kind of system? Um, I I can't give you a number, but I do know that they plan to have a battery. So it's that is that it's a good question, but and you would have to design that in in a with local knowledge of typical rain duration. Um, you would have to charge some battery on on the little sensor platform to accommodate a period of exposure or a week or two to to power the the device. So you know, I, I assume the plan is solar power as baseline with a, a battery obviously for the night at the very minimum but yeah they would have to be charged to accommodate some extended periods of you know, heavy cloud cover and rain and although I've seen they've also suggested an option to be wind generators I don't know that that's compatible with heavy rain in a tropical region too though where it's usually vertical and there's not not a lot of wind or a very short period of intense wind in there. So, yeah, it will come down to a battery, probably. So, uh, you will use the uh, UHF bands for the uh, transmitter. Yeah, and yes. so maybe there are many, much noise. Uh, so, so it will maybe, uh, I'm afraid that the signal will be suppressed by the noise. How you can solve this problem? Yeah, we are all also <laughs> suffering from the same yeah. problem. Yeah, um, yeah uh, th that you would have to look at in more detail with, say, the power on the on each sensor. I mean, I think it's, it's only going to get worse at higher frequencies with rain, so probably my f off the top of my head, the first thing would be just examining what power you could increase it to, you know, staying within UHF. We are using the one watt. RF power from the ground is one watt. Is it? I th okay, it may be. I thought that was on the satellite, but yeah, it, it might have to be more than it might have to. Uh, one of the options was to include some sort of microprocessor controller, and I think originally that was to do it a bit of extra processing with the signal, but maybe instead that could be used to monitor the conditions and increase the power if the rain was there or increase the power lower if uh, in good conditions so that you could optimize the use of the power perhaps okay so another question is that uh, how the ground sensor or ground transmitter detect when the sat uh, when the satellite flies over its area so um, the satellite uh, sorry yeah the honest answer is i don't know but if there is a I would the, the simplest system would just be continuous transmission at a sensible period and then you overcome that problem as long as you don't deplete your batteries overnight or something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
solution. Uh, there are, uh, I don't, I think uh, there are uh, more than one uh, ground station for monitoring the uh, water level. Uh, how do how, uh, we, uh, we can, how uh, do you do you think about the uh, interference? Or uh, many many of the ground station uh, transmit the data to satellite simultaneously. Uh, there there should be a, uh, some kind of interference. How do you avoid such kind of interference um, this using of system? Yes, that that was a point I mentioned earlier on as as, as the thing that I, I see as being the, the most challenging because yeah, you are right. The satel like I said, the satellite is going to be both the ground station and maybe hundreds of sensors at the same time and you have to take all of those differentiate between them and pass them down in the right order and so on. So um, it was going to be on the next slide, but uh, the way ahead was, I think, is build a prototype sensor to make sure it works and op optimize the power usage of it, and B, to look at ex exactly the problem that you mentioned, is work out how you're going to do that before going any further. And when those two things are sorted out, then it's a good time to talk to both in both our countries, the local authorities, uh, to to look for funding and to try and take the project further forward. But I agree that that's the main issue that I see is what needs to be sorted out, and and it's just the data management and the data handling problems that yeah it, it hasn't been addressed.